Kapoor College. I welcome you all in this one-day international webinar, COVID-19 Pandemic, a Search for Relief, organized by Department of Chemistry in association with Internal Quality Assurance Cell, that is IQSC, Charuchandra College, Kolkata, India. Uh, this evening, we have with us uh, our chief patron and teacher in charge of Charuchandra College, Professor Onuradha Ghosh, and IQAC coordinator, Dr. Shuparna Sen. I now request uh, Professor Ghosh to inaugurate the webinar and say a few words. Over to Onuradha. Good evening, everybody, and good morning. Uh, one of our speakers, Dr. Tandon, since he is speaking from very far. Uh, well, uh, I, you know, in this situation that we are going through, the situation of the pandemic, we are really very worried as to what will happen to us, and we do not know the way out of it right now. So the very relevant topic that is going to be spoken about today by y'all will be uh, regarding the antibody uh, type setting. Uh, you know, since it is not related to my subject, I may be wrong somewhere. And about the vaccine, you know. So we are really looking forward eagerly to listen from you so that it gives us a ray of hope. And for today, I declare this webinar open and over to Shati for the next speaker. Thank you, Onuradhadi. Uh, I would now request uh, Dr. Shuparna Sen, our IQAC coordinator, to call her welcome note. Shuparna Di. <coughs> Namaskar. On behalf of IQAC Charuchandru College, I extend a very warm welcome to our speakers, Dr. Ritesh Tandon and Dr. Upasana Roy. Dr. Ritesh Tandon will be talking on SARS-CoV-2, uh, pseudotyping and neutralizing antibody response. And Dr. Upasana Rai will be talking about uh, the new vaccine, when it will be available to us. Anyway, both of these topics are extremely pertinent to us nowadays. We are all eager to know the outcome of the research and in order to search for a, we are all very eager. We are all looking forward to a relief because this pandemic has left us so very insecure. We do not know what to do. Uh, it has left us feeling very helpless. So we are all looking forward tremendously for a cure and, uh, and to know when a vaccine will be available to us. We are sure that our learned speakers will enlighten us and, as our TIC has said, will make us uh, hopeful uh, that we will once again live in a COVID-free society. Uh, with all this, without much ado, without wasting much time, I once again welcome the speakers and ask them to share their, request them to share their knowledge with us. Thank you. Welcome to the speakers once again. Thank you, Shukarnadi. In tune with Professor Ghosh and Dr. Sten, really we are living in a very difficult phase, fighting with the invisible enemy. Now, uh, scientists, researchers, and doctors, they all over the world are brainstorming and uh, trying their best to uh, lead us the way out of this maze. Now we are eagerly waiting uh, for the speakers to uh, present their uh, uh, topic. And I am privileged to introduce the speakers. So we come to the first session or the actual session of the webinar. Our first speaker is Dr. Ritesh Tandon, Associate Professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology in University of Mississippi Medical Center. After graduating in veterinary sciences and animal husbandry 
from jimmy pant university he did his masters and phd from university of georgia athens thereafter he joined as postdoc fellow in very prestigious john hopkins university and emory university school of medicine and then he joined umc that is university of mississippi medical center as assistant professor he is recognized internationally for his research work in herpes virus he is a fellow of american heart association has many publication in prestigious journals supervised many students who are now recipient of many awards he is also in editorial board of scientific reports from nature publishing group and frontiers in microbiology currently he is involved in a very interesting research of space biology project of nasa dr tanjan over to you thank you dr datta for the very kind introduction and uh, it is my great honor to present some of the work we have been doing with sars cov2 over the last few months uh, as dr datta mentioned uh, my background has been in herpes viruses Uh, but i have been in the microbiology and immunology department uh, at a medical school here this is a pretty good uh, pretty big medical school and uh, when the pandemic struck we did not have a corona virologist here but uh, in virology one of the things i wanted to mention is the basic techniques you learn you can you are equipped to handle any sort of pathogen when the time comes uh, that would be one of my messages for today so uh i would like to share the slides and hopefully you can see my slides that will make it easier for me to present okay Can you all see my slides? Okay. If uh, if not, I will just talk about it. But hopefully, hopefully you can see the PowerPoint slides on my screen. Is it visible to all of you? Yes, sir. Oh, it's visible. Okay, so that makes yes. my job much easier. um so in the first slide that i'm showing you um this is something you have all seen and uh, known a lot this is uh, a diagram of the sars cov2 um it's it's a corona beta uh, corona virus as you all know uh, one of the important features in this is the yellow spike protein that you see on the top these are the surface glycoproteins that a lot of uh, viruses have and uh, sars cov2 is uh, is an enveloped virus uh, and uh, it has these projections on the top and uh, these are these proteins are really important in uh, determining the antibody response as well as virus entry into the cell uh, the literature that has come up in last 5 to 6 months has uh, very clearly established uh, host ace2 or angiotensin converting enzyme 2 as the receptor for sars cov2 and the spike protein binds to this receptor uh, the mechanism is, uh, is is still being studied but uh, what we know at this point is there are host proteases host enzymes that cleave this spike protein into two parts uh, s1 and s2 as you can show in the cartoon here uh, s1 is uh, the part that binds to ace2 receptor on the cell and uh, s2 is the part that's more fusogenic fusogenic means it uh, mediates the fusion of the virus membrane with the host membrane and that fusion leads to entry uh, that is the basic virology and uh, i was going to show you what we did in this setting so we pseudotyped sars cov2 uh, now what does pseudotyping mean it means that uh, you take the surface glycoprotein from one virus and you put on another virus 
and uh, you use a less pathogenic or not replication competent virus so that you can study it in a lower biosafety settings. And this has been done with a lot of viruses, especially the BSL-3 and 4 viruses, such as Ebola and Marburg, uh, and even HIV. So uh, the virus that we are using is, is a lentivirus. And uh, lentivirus, uh, they are retroviruses. They are slow replicating retroviruses. HIV is one example. But we have uh, made this replication incompetent, which means that the virus is only capable of one round of replication. It does not replicate after that. So that gives us an opportunity to study SARS-CoV-2, which is a BSL-3 virus in a lower biosafety settings. This is uh, a schematic of uh, how we made the virus. And uh, what you do is you take different components of uh, HIV, for example, here. Uh, and we don't take the surface glycoprotein from HIV. We take the surface glycoprotein from SARS-CoV-2. And we put uh, in, the, in the blue, uh, you can see on the left, there's a plasmid that's encoding for a spike. Uh, in the green, there is a lentivirus backbone that has component of the lentivirus. And then you have these uh, different um, uh, proteins that lentivirus needs to package. And uh, we all uh, we put all these uh, plasmids, express them in mammalian cells, 293Ts mostly that are used. And the product of this uh, transfection is uh, a virus that has the internal genome of uh, lentivirus and the coat of a SARS-CoV-2. And once you have these viruses, you can visualize them in electron microscopy, and you can do a lot of other uh, biochemistry-based characterization. And then uh, you can use these viruses to infect cells. Now, these cells have to be expressing ACE2, which is the receptor for uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, ACE2 is expressed in a lot of human cells. Uh, but uh, most of the cells, uh, except pulmonary cells and some endothelial cells, do not uh, express this in very high quantity. So what we have done is we have taken native cells as well as cells where we have overexpressed is 2 so that the virus entry is intact or efficient. Now, this, uh, this figure or slide here shows a study uh, that was recently published in Nature. And uh, what they are looking for in left, they are looking for a pseudovirus, the kind of virus that we made, and the actual COVID-2 virus. And the reason I wanted to put this slide up is, if you look at the very top, the red line and the purple lines, these are different neutralizing antibodies. And uh, if you compare between left and right, the pseudovirus neutralization is very similar to live virus neutralization. So that gives us confidence that pseudovirus, uh, first of all, it expresses the protein uh, in a native conformation. And uh, it's as efficient in uh, responding to the neutralizing antibody as a live virus. So this is a good surrogate system if you want to study in a non-BSL-3 uh, kind of lab, which are uh, very difficult. And it takes a lot of time, a lot of approvals. Uh, to work in a BSL-3 lab. So we wanted to design an assay where we can study the neutralizing antibody response in a lower biosafety uh, setting. So <clears throat> we used, um, we actually used two different systems when we started out. We used uh, a lentiviral or PLV on the top that you see here, and a murine uh, leukemia virus system as well. That's another retrovirus system. And as a control, we pseudotyped the vesicular stomatitis virus G protein, VSVG, which is a gold standard for pseudotyping. It, it easily pseudotypes any sort of virus, and it's a very fusogenic protein. So the transduction or infection into cells is very efficient. Uh, on the right, you see the COV2S is being pseudotyped on PLV and MMLV. And um, you can tell from this that uh, COV2 pseudotype uh, pseudotypes PLV efficiently, but not MMLV. So we did most of our experiments on this PLV pseudotype, COVID-2S. And this is a, a, a figure where we show that um, different, at least three different cell types 
can be transduced. Transduced uh, transduction is is a term we use for uh, lentiviral infection. So I can I can interchange infection and transduction. So when we transduced uh, uh, two ninety three T cells and Vero cells and uh, the two ninety three cells expressing ACE two, you can see the differences. So VSVG gives you very good titers or very good uh, GFP expression. And GFP is integrated into the lentivirus backbone. So you get a lot of GFP expression when we are just using VSVG. Uh, when serotype with COVID-2S, we get uh, maximum expression in 293T cells, and especially the cells that have ACE2 expression. So you can see in the bottom F panel, we have probed with a in a Western blot how much ACE2 is being expressed, and there is very little ACE2 in native Vero and 293T cells. Uh, Vero cells have been used, and these are monkey uh, kidney cells, and they have been used a lot in COVID and coronavirus research. And SARS-CoV-2 has been shown to grow on Vero cells, so it was surprising that we did not get a lot of uh, transduction in Vero cells, uh, but uh, we. Uh, we think this is because Vero cells do not express a lot of uh, ACE2, and that is shown at the bottom panel. So for our experiments, we used either the ACE2 overexpressing 293T cells or the native 293T cells, because we could see even with very low level, level of uh, ACE2 expression, 293T cells were giving us enough transduction to study the neutralizing antibody response. So this is uh, <clears throat> about um, late March when we started to see COVID patients in our hospital. And uh, we got, uh, initially we got uh, approval to get serum samples from these patients. And uh, the initial two patients uh, we selected were, there was uh, N3 of four, and this person uh, was positive in a RT-PCR assay. RT-PCR is what we use uh, traditionally to diagnose uh, SARS-CoV-2 and a lot of other pathogens, but most of the tests you see on the street or on the hospital are actually RT-PCR tests. So this person was RT-PCR positive. Uh, he did undergo a very severe COVID-19 pneumonia, but eventually recovered. So the reason we were using this patient is um, we wanted to start a convalescent patient serum trial. And what that means is you get the serum from people who have recovered and they likely have antibodies that are neutralizing. So with antibodies, you can have, you can have very high levels, uh, but uh, they may or may not be neutralizing. So the idea with the pseudotype assay is to see antibodies that are neutralizing. So if you see the ELISA titers on the right, so we mainly look for IgM and IgG um, you probably all know in immunology, there are five different kind of uh, human antibodies. Uh, IgM and G are the ones that we are mostly interested in because IgM is, is an early or acute response. And then later on, uh, there is class switching and you get IgG response. So N304 had very high um, IgM as well as IgG levels. And uh, N308 was our negative control because he was RT-PCR negative. Uh, he did suffer some mild symptoms, mild respiratory symptoms, uh, like cold. And uh, he thought he had COVID, uh, so he came for a test and uh, was not positive in the RT-PCR test. So we got the serum from him, and uh, in our ELISAs, uh, he had very low titers. So that confirms that he was not COVID positive. So we use, use these two, and on the left, you see the inhibition curve using the pseudotype particles. So you dilute the serum, and uh, uh, you see at about 1 to 40 to 180 dilution with N304, which is on the top, you see almost 80 to 85 percent inhibition of the pseudovirus which tells you that this person not only had high titers, ELISA antibodies, these antibodies were neutralizing. And um, as obvious, the N308 patient did not have neutralizing antibodies. So this served as a proof of principle for something we were trying to develop. Now, this is uh, a summary of uh, what's going on, uh, going on at our clinical center. And uh, we have performed, uh, as a group, we have performed more than 57,000 tests. 
and more than 6,600 of these tests uh, have come out positive. Um, <clears throat> in the middle, it shows you uh, the testing, uh, weekly testing, and you can see the trend is still going up uh, in Mississippi or in the South in the US. So we are still hoping to get this under control uh, with social distancing measures and uh, wearing the mask. So mask and social distancing have come to a great relief, actually, even without the vaccine or without having a very effective antivirals, we have seen a community transmission reduction by just using masks and social distancing. On the very right, you see different clinical trials that are going on. And there is an arrow against uh, number 17. And uh, that's an ob open label trial for transfusion of uh, convalescent patient serum. What that means is we are trying to get samples from these convalescent patients. And uh, we are using the serum from these, as long as they have neutralizing titers of more than one is to 80, we are utilizing this serum in a clinical trial to provide to people, especially COVID patients who have severe pneumonia. And um, the results uh, are, just, this is an ongoing trial. We haven't really um, collected all the results, but uh, it seems promising to some extent that um, <clears throat> infusion of these antibodies may be able to help resolve some of the symptoms or um, at least uh, prevent the mortality, the high mortality that we are seeing in these patients that are more vulnerable, like very old, over 60 year old and uh, with severe pneumonia and who are in uh, ICU. So these, these are the <clears throat> target population for transfusion. Um, the CDC currently recommends uh, that you, if you have more than one is to 160 uh, titers, you can use uh, this serum uh, <clears throat> for transfusion. So uh, the other part of this is even if uh, you don't have the neutralizing titers now, we are saving all the samples. So we are allowed to save the samples uh, in a long term. And then we can look at the neutralizing antibody response in the whole population. Um, in the whole population, I mean, you can get a representative sample from the population and you can see how much of neutralizing antibodies people in the general population have. And that gives you an idea about herd immunity. So you might have heard a lot about herd immunity. And with COVID-2, it's estimated that if the herd immunity can reach over 70%, you will have the virus in control. Uh, right now, we are seeing very low levels. We have done a few surveillance studies and we are only seeing 2.5 to 3% uh, positivity rate for antibodies. Um, uh, so, so we are nowhere close to reaching herd immunity at this point, but this is a test that should help us later on studying longitudinally what happens in the population. So we are authorized to take samples from the population at different time points, and uh, we can track individual uh, person and see if uh, they become positive over time or they develop these antibodies. So this, uh, the utility of this assay that we developed is not only with the convalescent plasma trial, it's uh, also with studying the population in general. And especially when we have a vaccine, we can use this assay to see if the vaccine is effective in the population and it's raising neutralizing antibodies. So these are a few other patients that uh, we did. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, when we calculate uh, IC50, which is the inhibitory concentration that inhibits 50% of the pseudovirus. Uh, we see very high IC50s when we have higher titers. So that means that you need very low amount of uh, antibodies from this particular patient, like N304, to really neutralize the virus. Uh, and you compare that with N308 that has a really low antibody titers as well as low uh, IC50s. So that means that you need a lot of this antibody uh, uh, for uh, for neutralizing the virus. So this is uh, this is the kind of data that we are collecting, and uh, one idea is to correlate with the uh, ELISA titer. So we there are usually three different tests that we are doing on a particular individual. When somebody reports, and I'm not a clinician, I'm I'm more in the research side. But whenever we get uh, get someone in clinics with COVID symptoms, we do RT-PCR test. 
and um, if the person is positive in rt pcr we do elisa so you see igm and igg titers from elisa and then uh, from those individuals we select uh, based on their elisa titers which person to do a neutralizing antibody test on and then we report our log ic50s so, and this is something very similar to what everyone else is doing uh, at least in us uh, i know in india they are trying to do similar things uh, but uh, neutralizing antibody titers, uh, which is my area of work, uh, may be very helpful in long term when you're looking at what kind of antibodies, because we know very little about the biology of this virus yet. So um, it's, it's not the virus itself in its virology is not very different from other coronaviruses, but we don't know what kind of antibodies are raised because the antigens are different and antigen antibody kinetics are different. So this uh, this is something I, I wanted to present as a part of uh, our diagnostic protocol. And with that, uh, uh, since we have more time, I will talk a little bit about discovery of antivirals. And this is a very related project. And uh, we actually use the same assay, same neutralizing antibody assay that we use to discover a few antivirals. And the antivirals I'm going to talk about today are heparin and anoxaparin derivatives. So what are what is heparin? Heparin is a glycan. Uh, glycan is is a fancy name for a sugar, and uh, glycans or sugars are present on our cells. All all our cells, all mammalian cells, express sugars on their surface, and these sugars, uh, their pattern can determine what kind of pathogen can attack them. So they serve as the primary receptors. So we have all heard a lot about ACE2 and uh, host proteases as required for virus entry. But uh, the claim that we are going to make is these uh, glycosamino glycans or sugar on the cell surface are also important. So they work as primary attachment receptors and they hand over the virus to the secondary receptors, which are protein receptors such as ACE2. So uh, we, uh, we use, uh, so this, this slide shows you the glycosamine glycans that are present on cell surface. So there are mainly five different GAGs, uh, hyaluronic acid, which is not sulfated. And then you have a sulfated GAGs, uh, such as heparin or heparin sulfate, and dermatin sulfate, chondroitin sulfate, and keratin sulfate. And uh, they are made of different sugar units, such as uh, uh, glucosamine and glucuronic acid, hyaluronic acid. And uh, the structure of these sugars can determine what kind of pathogen can attach to these. So this is the model that uh, we are proposing. And uh, what happens here is the virus binds to heparin sulfate or heparin sulfate proteoglycan on the surface. And then this engagement leads to uh, handing over of the virus to ACE2 type receptors. And finally, virus would either fuse with the plasma membrane or would get endocytosed and later on would fuse with the endocytic membrane leading to virus entry. Um, so these are the sugars that we tested. So we tested heparin and we also tested some uh, sulfated um, uh, galactan and fucan type sugars from marine organisms. And the structures are shown on the on the right. And uh, I don't want to go too much into chemistry, but just wanted to point out that these sugars can be sulfated at different positions in the rings that you see here. And based on them, that, they are termed either N-sulfated or 2-O-sulfated or 3 or 6 or sulfated uh, And these are supplied by our chemist friends, and they do their characterization by NMR. So this is the assay that we did and we tested these in our neutralizing assay to see if uh, these sugars can actually inhibit the virus. And uh, you can see in the graph on the right, uh, we tested three different concentrations and you can see that uh, UFH, which is uh, ultra fractionated heparin, was able to reduce the transduction of cells in, in the neutralizing virus assay, which means that the virus is being neutralized by ultra fractionated heparin. Also, when you desulfate heparin at the 6S position, you see uh, a good degree of inhibition, but not when you desulfate at the end terminal. So the sulfation of heparin has an impact on virus inhibition activity. 
Also, um, if you uh, if you fully desulfate it, you don't see inhibition. And anoxaparin, which is a low molecular weight heparin, has similar activity where the 6 s desulfation is still effective as the parent compound. And the fully desulfation and end desulfation are not effective against the virus. You can also see results from some of the marine sulfated sugars on the right, and they seem to be effective. So um, with that, we did a few inhibition assays, and we determined their IC50s, which are the 50% inhibitory concentrations. And uh, not going too much into numbers, I just wanted to point out that ultra fractionated heparin and the desulfated six position heparin are very effective. Their IC50s are in micrograms per liter, which is uh, considered a very, a very low amount uh, to be able to inhibit the virus. So this is something that can really go into clinics because heparin has been used for almost 80 years uh, with potentially no side effects other than anticoagulation activity. Uh, the anticoagulation activity of heparin may also add to its use uh, along with the antiviral activity that we are seeing because in a lot of COVID patients, we see the coagulopathy or thrombosis or blood clots, basically, that can lead to stroke and other complications. Um, these uh, findings were confirmed with uh, an SPR, uh, which is surface plasma resonance. Um, and uh, in that, what you do is you immobilize heparin on a chip, and then you treat it with the virus. This is the virus that we made. And you can see in the graph that the virus binds and then, then it's released. So it's, uh, it's the kinetics that we are studying here. And uh, you can see about 150 to 200 seconds, you see an equilibrium of binding. And you see more binding when you use more of the compound. That means that uh, heparin is actually specifically binding to the virus in these uh, binding SPR measurements, experiments as well. And then we did uh, a few a few other experiments where we compared heparin to other sulfated um, uh, sugars or glycosamine and glycans. And you can see in the graph that heparin uh, is the most effective compound when it comes to binding to these pseudotype particles. So you have uh, heparin sulfate, different types of chondritin sulfate, uh, dermatin sulfate, keratin sulfate on the right. Uh, but among them, looks like uh, uh, the normalized binding to heparin. And this is this is more of a, a competition assay. So you're looking the graph in opposite, which means that something that binds to pseudo particles actually would give you lower values because it's competing out. So you put more of that compound, it competes out the heparin that's already bound. So heparin can compete itself, but other compounds cannot compete with heparin. And then we studied the effect of chain length of heparin on the binding. And uh, here you can see that um, the DP18, which is uh, basically branch length 18. So this is an uh, oligosaccharide. So you get more and more branch lengths. So you keep adding more and more oligosaccharides uh, when you synthesize heparin. And uh, a branch length of 18 and above would be very effective. So more branches of oligosaccharide you have more effective it is in competing to heparin. Uh, and with that, we also synthesized a few um, synthetic heparins where we uh, sulfated heparin at three different positions. And uh, we also used a non-anticoagulant NSCH form of heparin because we wanted to separate out the coagulation activity from the antiviral activity to be able to use heparin in patients uh, that have uh, that cannot tolerate uh, the coagulation and the anticoagulation activity of heparin. Uh, some people have uh, lower ability to tolerate heparin. They can have hemorrhages and uh, uh, and bleeding because of heparin. So we wanted to design a heparin that's non-anticoagulant and is still being effective. So when we tested these uh, different forms of heparin. Uh, we could uh, uh, we could also determine the IC50. The IC50 was uh, about 0.215 uh, micromolar for uh, for for the heparin for the soluble heparin, and uh, 
And for the other compounds, um, it was about uh, 0.5 uh, micromolar and 25 micromolar. There is still very low values. So they, they still can be useful in clinics. And we actually have a clinical trial going on with heparin in uh, patients um, that have severe COVID, as well as in, uh, in the general population to use heparin as a prophylactic. And uh, these results were confirmed by our collaborator in an actual virus assay because we wanted to make sure that these compounds are working uh, not only in a pseudovirus system, but on actual virus as well. So what you see here is a virus uh, uh, foci or plaque, you can call it. And uh, at the very bottom, when you don't have any polysaccharides, you see a lot of blue and dots. Those blue dots are all focus or foci formed from the virus. Uh, as you see, when you don't have the virus, you don't see any of these foci. And uh, when you have uh, NACH or heparin, you see there is a significant reduction in the number of foci. Uh, that tells you that this uh, these compounds are active against live virus as well. So with that, uh, <clears throat> what uh, I want you to uh, take the message from this talk is that uh, we can pseudotype SARS-CoV-2 in a lentiviral system. There are a few other systems that are coming up as well. Uh, there is a baculovirus system and there is a VSV pseudotyping system where they are doing the opposite of what we did. So they are basically deleting the glycoprotein from VSV and putting SARS-CoV-2 uh, protein on top. Uh, but lentiviral system seems to be working and can be used to study neutralizing antibody response in patient serum. And uh, <clears throat> these uh, the same assay you can also use for screening of virus entry inhibitors as we did with heparin. Uh, the <clears throat> inhibitory activities of uh, these different compounds suggest that there is a flexibility in the binding site because if you think about the structure of fucan and galactan, and heparin, there is quite a bit of difference. So we are still studying the structural activity relationship of all these, but seems like there is a flexibility in the spike protein and glycosamine and glycan binding site. The poor inhibitory activity of chondritin sulfate is important because uh, it indicates that it's not a question of presenting negative charge on linear polymer. So a lot of these uh, uh, GAG studies uh, are reviewed and they get the comment that it's only a charge-charge interaction. But the data we have shows that it's not a charge-charge interaction because chondritin sulfate has similar charge to heparin sulfate or heparin, but it still is not being able to inhibit the virus. This suggests that the inhibitory activity is due to a structure-related uh, activity. Uh, so this this is the point uh, that was also confirmed uh, with uh, uh, with the chondritin sulfate D uh, and E because uh, these uh, these two compounds have one uh, sulfur group and they competed with the compound with a two sulfur group. So it's not only about charge. Also, if you desulfate uh, either completely desulfate or and desulfate, that decreases the activities. So, uh, but if you desulfate at 6O, it does not decrease the activity. So that also supports the idea that it's more about a structure than the net charge on the sugar. Uh, also, the spike protein coated pseudovirus showed a very tight binding to immobilized heparin in our SPR experiments. So that shows that uh, soluble and non-anticoagulant uh, heparin can be used um, as uh, as uh, something that can be tried in clinical trials. So what we are doing at this point is we're trying to establish a correlation between antibody levels, we see in ELISA, and our neutralizing antibody response. And I talked about some of the biosurveillance studies that are going on. And uh, we are more interested in the longevity of antibody response here because the data from SARS-CoV-1 suggests that you can have antibodies uh, last in serum for a year or maybe more, but not really more than two to three years. So that is that is an important question from vaccine standpoint as well as herd immunity standpoint, that if we do get immunity against this virus, how long that immunity is going to last. Uh, we also need to characterize our PLVS by different techniques. Um, and biochemistry, and uh, we need to 
determine the structural activity relationship with the sulfated polysaccharides. Uh, there are possible therapeutic as well as prophylactic uh, drug development. And one of the ideas use using heparin as uh, an intranasal spray. And uh, because it's inhibiting the virus, it's possible that if you can have the non-anticoagulant heparin is sprayed into nostrils. It may be able to prevent virus infection. And this, that's a clinical trial that's going on right now. And if that works, that would mean that um, at least one thing it would mean that we would no longer need to wear the mask if we can carry this heparin spray with us. Uh, the long-term toxicology and pharmacokinetic studies are still undergoing. And uh, we are currently collecting the data from that. So that's all I had to talk about today and hope you gathered some useful information from this. And uh, in the end, I would like to acknowledge all the people who have been doing the work, uh, especially Dr. Marshall, who's running the clinical trial, uh, Dr. Bates, who's doing uh, the ELISAs for us, and then students in my group, uh, Deepa, Puna, Martin, and Christian, who have really been involved in this uh, COVID projects because you all know I've been working on herpes viruses so they literally had to uh, take time off from their actual PhD projects and uh, concentrate on the COVID-19 projects which uh, which is not even their PhD projects so I'm really thankful that they took the time off and really with all these uh, social distancing settings and wearing masks all the time working really late hours so really thankful for those. Then our chemist friends at the University of Mississippi, uh, uh, Dr. Sharp, Dr. Ashpole, Dr. Pomin, and Dr. Chogle, and also my other student, Hao. And uh, our other friends at RPI, Dr. Linhar, Dr. Zhang, and Jin. And we were supported uh, for these studies uh, with the local funding from University of Mississippi, as well as from NASA. So thank you so much, and uh, I'm really uh, thankful to you all for giving me the opportunity to present. And uh, please feel free to email me or ask me any questions later on um, if, if you have regarding the neutralizing antibody assays or uh, what are the other uses of this assay. So with that, I would like to conclude. And uh, thank you, Dr. Datta, so much for the invitation. Hope uh, you enjoyed the talk and you got something useful out of it. Thank you, Dr. Tandon. It was a really comprehensive and very useful and informative lecture, and we could uh, know uh, the research is going on this COVID-19, uh, our biggest enemy of this time. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Halda, can we have a question answer session if we have questions? Yes, yes. Yeah, so the first question I see is from uh, Suman Das, and he's asking, there are so many different strains of SARS-CoV-2. Is it possible that these have mutated from a single source? Are there any assessment of IgG neutralization against different strains of SARS-CoV-2? Uh, that's a really good question, uh, Suman. So we are still trying to characterize the, what are the strains that are circulating. And um, virologists don't really like to call them a strain um, at this point, because when you have a fully characterized strain, it has different pathogenesis and uh, established impact of the mutation on virus replication. So at this point, uh, one of the differences we have seen is uh, a mutation called D641G in the receptor binding domain of a spike protein. And that seems to have uh, affected transmission to some extent. There, there is little bit of data on that side. Uh, so <clears throat> right now we are seeing differences, but a lot of these differences are in the non-coding regions or in regions that don't really have a, a really evident impact on transmission or pathogenesis. So would this evolve? Yeah, it may evolve and uh, different uh, mutants may have different uh, response or different neutralizing antibodies. But at this point, uh, we have been a little lucky with this because it's a coronavirus and uh, coronaviruses uh, have a good proofreading activity, which means that when they make errors, they actually correct those errors. They have an enzyme to correct those errors. So, and that's one reason we have not seen a lot of variation 
uh, we have certain clades. Uh, we have the Chinese clade and the European clade, then North American clade, and they are a little different. But uh, there is no reason at this point to really think that the antibody responses would be drastically different. Uh, but as you know, this is a new virus, so we are still studying. But uh, I'm I'm pretty uh, confident that this we are not going to see as many mutations as we see in a flu. So flu, you know, if you think about it's a negative strain RNA virus. It's segmented, the seven segments in the genome. And uh, also, it does not have a proofreading ability. So it mutates really fast, and it has genetic recombinations and genetic drift and shifts. So coronaviruses, uh, we have been lucky that we do not have that kind of rapid mutation rate in coronaviruses. Uh, hope that answers uh, your question. Um, Parimal Rauth is asking how valuable is convalescent plasma from COVID-19 patients for inhibiting SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV infection? So <clears throat> I believe what you mean is uh, the COVID-19. Uh, SARS, we do not have SARS-CoV infection uh, at present. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 is what's circulating. And uh, I think what you mean is can you get plasma from the initial the 2003 SARS-CoV patients and use that for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I'm not aware of any study that has looked into it. Uh, the virus is um, different enough to believe that uh, the antibodies raised against COV, original COV may not be useful, but we don't know. That's, that's not something that has been done. And there's a very little population. I think there were a total of 8,600 people that actually got the original SARS-CoV infection, and they were mostly based in uh, China and Hong Kong. So at a local level, it's not really feasible to do those studies. Uh, with SARS-CoV-2 patients, uh, we have seen some encouraging data, uh, but uh, this is still in clinical trials, so we cannot draw any conclusions from the convalescent study. But the idea is you can get the serum which is very easy to get. And this is not, this is what every hospital can do. They can get the serum and they can do the transfusion. Um, on, a, on a bigger level, you can purify neutralizing antibodies from the serum and then you can use those antibodies for therapy. So uh, I hope that that answers your question. Uh, Krishna Chaudhary is asking, what are the updates of relation of heparin in relation to control of COVID-19? So this is something uh, that's uh, this is still in clinical trial. And the clinicians who are using heparin as anticoagulant, they are using at very late stages. And in patients who have thrombosis issues or some coagulation issues. So using heparin as an antiviral is still being tried. And uh, hopefully we will have the data soon on that. Uh, Kaushiki, what is the exact mode of action of heparin to inhibit virus? Uh, the data we have so far suggests that um, heparin or heparin sulfate-like sugars, they bind to a spike protein. I did not show the data about um, uh, the actual uh, characterization of uh, protein of, of heparin binding sites on a spike because that's still in development. But there is enough evidence to suggest that uh, this could be uh, competitively binding to the spike protein and uh, allowing the virus to not enter the cells. Okay, thank you so much. If there are no other questions, I will hand it over to Dr. Dutta. Thank you, Dr. Tendon. Now we have come to the second session of our webinar. Our second speaker of the webinar is Dr. Upasana Ray, Senior Scientist, Indian, Chemical, Indian Institute of Chemical Biology, Kolkata, India after completing graduation and post-graduation from Delhi University, she did her PhD in virology from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Thereafter, she joined National Cancer Institute 
uh, National Institute of Health, Maryland, USA. She was Ramanujan Fellow in IIT Kharagpur, Ramalinga Swami Fellow at IICB. She is recipient of several awards and the most noted ones are Federal Technology Transfer Award, Fellow Award for Research Excellence from NIH, SARB Women Excellence Award, ILDC AMP Women Excellence Award, INSA Medical for Young Scientist. She is a member of Royal Society of Biology, elected member of Indian National Young Academy of Science, full member of Organization for Women in Science in Developing World. She has US patent for immunogenic JC polyomavirus composition and method of use. Her active area of research being dengue and chikungunya and recently SARS-CoV-2. She is also a member of COVID testing group, IICB, member of COVID-19 expert committee for INSA. Over to Dr. Ray. Thank you, Dr. Datta. That was overwhelming for me. <laughs> That's a <clears throat> wonderful uh, introduction that you gave. And um, I mean, uh, thank you so much. So let me know uh, if you can uh, see my slide. Um, so let me share my screen first. Okay. You can see my screen now. Can you uh, see my screen? No. Uh, my slides are visible to everyone. Is uh, my screen visible? Uh, Dr. Datta? No. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, 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 it should be. Uh, so, um, so can you see the COVID-19 vaccine? Where are we? The first slide. No. Um, I should. Uh, Several windows oh. are being opened up. Okay. Let me uh, let me redo it then. Sharing. Okay. Now I think it should work. Right. Um, yeah. I hope you can see it now. Can you see it now? No, actually, many windows are open. Ma'am, kindly um, present the slide. Only the yeah yeah yeah. I, Dr. Haldar, can you guide her? No, no, no. Just, uh, just uh, present the slide, first slide. Ma'am, present the first slide. I already did that. It's on my screen. There and I shared it in sharing also at the bottom. Yeah. Of a there is the okay. Okay, 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 okay. Now, now visible. Visible, okay. I think there's a gap. Yeah. No. Okay. Anyway, so let me start. So thank you so much once again, everyone. 
And uh, so as uh, discussed, I will be talking about where are we on COVID-19 vaccine. So I guess in uh, as we saw that uh, in our audience, we have a lot of students and different kinds of students. We have uh, college students, maybe some are senior, some are junior in the field. So uh, in, I, I'll give a very tiny introduction about uh, the vaccine, uh, what a vaccine is, and a little bit uh, about the background of what are the different kinds of vaccines and how the vaccine, uh, a vaccine candidate is generated and administered, et cetera. Okay. So, um, yeah, so and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tandon, uh, for making my life easy. And uh, already have been doing COVID 19 uh, to the audience. So I won't go into much details into it. Uh, so uh, last year uh, in December uh, 2019, um, there was an outbreak in China, in the city of Wuhan. And uh, as uh, we all know, we are talking about COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. We also call it as SARS-CoV-2. And this is how the virus looks like. It's, it looks like uh, a very nice wall structure, right? It's very pretty. So it looks very pretty, but it is not that pretty. We know it, uh, there was an outbreak and then it spread to the entire world. It uh, caused a major uh, pandemic. Uh, so uh, WHO called it, uh, announced it as a pandemic this year. And you can see here, last uh, yesterday I have gathered this information from uh, GIC website. And this is a very recent information about the global outbreak of uh, COVID-19, how many different countries uh, uh, throughout the world have been already affected. You can see in uh, red over here. And these are the total uh, global cases. You know, it's so many, right? And uh, 188 uh, overall countries have already been affected. And many have perished, lost their lives. So um, it... Since we ran into a crisis period uh, this time, um, it was very surprising and it was very amazing and impressive to see how R&D activities went on. So in a very uh, short period of time, since we had to fight against COVID-19 and we are still fighting, uh, we did so many different things. So scientists all over the world, they worked in so many different aspects of COVID-19, uh, starting from diagnosis. Diagnostics, um, then uh, testing, as already Dr. Tanjan explained, um, throughout the world it's still going on. And then there were drug discoveries, new drug targets being discovered. So when I say new drug targets, that means people studied the viral life cycle, biology of the virus has been studied, and uh, they uh, pointed out what all different steps in the viral life cycle can be targeted. Then uh, scientists are working on novel drug candidates along with novel drug candidates that takes time. Uh, there has been a lot of emphasis on uh, drug repurposing. Okay, like, uh, um, you know, Febupiravir has recently been released in the market. Similarly, there is Remdesivir, all have been uh, repurposed. And there are many more uh, trials going on. So apart from drugs and uh, diagnostics, there is another branch that I'll be focusing on today, that's a vaccine. So again, in the vaccine, the, uh, uh, the repurposing is going on. So I won't go into much detail in that area because that we don't have published literature yet how BCG, for example, BCG vaccine, polio vaccine have been in use for quite a uh, uh, quite often, but uh, we don't have a very strong literature to talk about those vaccines for COVID-19 right now. And then there are novel vaccine candidates. So there are almost 139 uh, different vaccine uh, candidates that are under uh, preclinical trials uh, right now. And uh, some of uh, them have also gone into phase one and phase two, and very few are in phase three uh, clinical trials. So we'll come on that. So what is a vaccine? So vaccine, uh, this arm basically comes under uh, the active immunization part uh, uh, of uh, immunology. And it actually, uh, what it does is it provides long-term protection. That's very important. So 
it will give you protective immunity and immunological memory extremely important immunological memory and the most important effector molecules of the immune systems are uh, that needs to be uh, stimulated uh, if we are talking about vaccines are the tpn cells right we all know about that so won't uh, go into the biological details of what are t cells and the b cells so vaccine is basically a biological preparation when i say that biological preparation that means uh, the origin is uh, is biological so it uh, comes mainly from the pathogen and that provides you immunity how it provides you immunity it will stimulate your body's immune system so three very important things uh, it will help you recognize the uh, pathogen uh, as the foreign and destroy it for uh, the time being and for future uh it's very important for the body the immune system of uh, our body to remember this pathogen as a foreign so that in future if you get uh, um, you know infected by the same pathogen your body knows yes we i know this and now uh, it will quickly produce antibodies and uh, it will destroy it so that's how the vaccine should work now there are different types of vaccines uh, there are many more types i have just shown the very generic uh types of broad categories uh, uh, because these are the types uh, which scientists are uh, focusing on uh, for uh, engineering covid-19 vaccine candidates so the first category is uh, the whole organism vaccines so here you can see whole when i say whole organism vaccines that the term itself says you it involves the entire uh, organism here is a vaccine uh the virus right so the entire virus is taken into consideration but there are two different categories inactivated and live attenuated because you cannot use the pathogen for infection because it will cause you the disease so what you can do is you can either inactivate it fully or you can attenuate it now what is attenuation so for example if you have a virus that infects uh, say the human and uh, so if you want uh, to attenuate it or make it re uh, replication deficient in human what you are going to do is to take this um, virus and grow in uh, a different host system okay so when you make this virus adapt in its new host system and wait for some time and now the virus is adapted very well you take this virus again and put it back to human so what will happen this virus cannot grow properly uh, uh, in the human system and but it is growing very slow so it will continuously produce uh, the uh, viral proteins and thus your uh, immune system will slowly get uh, taught uh, that this is a foreign pathogen and i have to produce uh, antibodies right and it is not that uh, uh, that uh, you know pathogenic also but there are pros and cons so um, the positive part we know it's a vaccine candidate the negative part is that uh, sometimes it can revert back so it can uh, get uh, virulent get uh, virulent again so you don't want that but then that again uh, um, is checked when the vaccine candidate is made and we make sure that such accidents don't happen okay so uh, the example one such example is a live attenuated uh, uh, you know polio vaccine uh, and uh, even for inactivated vaccine you have uh, polio vaccine as example polio has two different types the oral polio vaccine and the injectable the ipv vaccine so inactivated vaccine when i say again is the whole entire virus but you inactivate it uh, using different chemicals so here what happens it changes conformationally the surface proteins uh, of the virus and now the virus cannot infect so here uh, uh, one uh, negative uh, side or um, uh, the uh, when i uh, talk about pros and cons is that uh, the if the inactivation is not properly done then it might be dangerous but again uh, companies do take care of this and uh, now there are uh, another uh, major category that is subunit vaccines what is a subunit vaccine so i spoke about the whole organism vaccine now subunit vaccines are nothing but the sub units of a pathogen so that is 
you take individual proteins of the virus or the pathogen and immunize uh, the uh, immunize um, uh, you know animals or human using those subunit uh, subunits of the pathogen so now each of these uh, vir uh, viral proteins can uh, elicit immune response specific for that particular protein likewise for covid 19 uh, mostly the focus has been on the spike protein so we'll come on that next is the gene based vaccines when i say gene based based vaccine that can be of different types uh, dna vaccine or rna vaccine when we have to use dna we use uh, plasmid based vectors so these are nothing but mammalian vectors which has the uh, uh, you know uh, an insert that expresses the protein of interest so the viral protein uh, is been um, uh, uh, you know produced using the uh, plasmid or mammalian expression system okay so this uh, involves a, a genetic engineering or recombinant uh, uh, you know plasmid um, technology recombinant technology and uh, the other type is the rna vaccine that is also been used in covid-19 vaccine uh, engineering so there are two rna vaccines under trial one by pfizer another one is been tried uh, by uh, you know the mrna 1273 uh, the nih based vaccine modernas so here you uh, take the rna um, rna and encapsulate or uh, you just use say a lipid platform to encapsulate the rna and deliver it directly and the rna is capable of producing uh, the protein of interest and elicit immune response the last one is the virus like particle it is a very promising system because um, like you know dr tandon talked about zero virus so here Uh, this doesn't involve a um, uh, you know a gene component or dna uh, that has been expressed by the viruses so the virus is empty but it's just like the virus okay so that is why it is called as virus like okay so how does a vaccine work there can be broadly i have written here dna vaccine but broadly vaccines work more or less uh, uh, using two different pathways the endogenous pathway and the exogenous pathway so when we talk about endogenous pathway say for example uh, a, a person has been immunized uh, using uh, intramuscular injection so this is a myocyte and uh, so what will happen uh, the uh, antigen will be expressed inside the cell and then it will be processed by um, uh, structures uh, cellular structures called as proteasomes so these proteasomes are organelles which will uh, process uh, the entire protein into small fragments so these fragments are now presented using mhc class 1 molecules mhc is major histocompatibility complex so mhc class 1 molecules will uh, present the antigen and antigenic peptides and it will be recognized by cd8 positive t cell another pathway is where uh, so okay so let's complete this so it is recognized by uh, cd8 positive t cells and then it will lead to production of cytokines there can be different kinds of cytokines and ultimately it will lead to lysis of the infected cells so basically the encoded protein is expressed processed and uh, then after uh, it is presented by the mhc class 1 molecules it stimulates the cytotoxic t cell pathway the other pathway involves uh, the antigen presenting cells or apcs Uh, APCs uh, have uh, or express MHC class two molecules, and uh, when APCs present the antigens using MHC class two molecules, they stimulate uh, the CD4 positive T cells, which bind to the MHC class two bound um, antigen antigens. and then they get stimulated and they also produce cytokines they can either uh, stimulate cd8 positive t cell and side by side stimulate the b cells okay so now the b cells are important once stimulated uh, b cell immunity is uh, stimulated uh, memory b cells are produced so b cells differentiate into plasma cells and the memory cells so these memory cells are very important you know in uh, plasma cells are the form of uh, a kind of b cells which will i'm using very generic terminology for everyone to understand so the plasma cells are the ones which are continuously producing the antibodies
So these are the um, uh, molecules which will now go and bind to the pathogen and uh, help in destruction. And the plasma cells, uh, the uh, memory B cells are the ones which are for future recognition, the memory, right? So both of uh, the pathways are extremely important. So now I'll explain a bit of the virus-like particles because a lot of vaccine candidates that have been focused um, uh, in COVID-19 vaccine field are based on virus-like particles or the VLPs. Okay. So, uh, so before I uh, we even start with VLPs, let's understand the different kinds of viruses. So the viruses can be of two different types, the enveloped and the non-enveloped viruses. When I say non-enveloped, it does it has basically a proteinaceous structure, which is basically the capsid or the outer shell of the virus that encapsidates inside or encases inside the genetic material of the virus, which can be a DNA, which can be a RNA or whatsoever. And then the, the other type of viruses are the enveloped viruses. So you have the capsid, or sometimes it's also called as a nucleocapsid. And on top of this nucleocapsid, you have a lipid envelope that is derived from the host cell. So this lipid envelope also uh, harbors another uh, few classes of viral proteins, the envelope proteins or the membrane proteins. Okay. So uh, these are the proteins uh, that uh, recognize the cellular receptors and mediate the virus entry. In case of non-enveloped viruses, it's the capsid protein that helps. Okay. So now when I talk about VLPs, as I already told uh, two slides back, uh, they do not uh, contain the viral genetic material. So they are devoid of the viral genetic material. So ideally or theoretically, it can be only the capsid. It can be only the lipid envelope having the uh, envelope and the matrix, uh, the membrane proteins, or you can have all of it together, the uh, nucleo, uh, the capsid without the genetic material and the envelope with the envelope proteins uh, on top of it. Okay. So why I am emphasizing on VLPs are because it's a upcoming. Uh, it is not a very new technology, but it is upcoming and it is a very hot uh, platform because um, it, uh, you know, the vi many viruses or a lot of viruses have this uh, capacity of uh, self assembly. So the mechanism of self assembly, viral uh, structural proteins, uh, they automatically or self assemble inside the cell and form the uh, virus uh, structure. So you don't have to really mediate it using different techniques. And the other thing is uh, the display of the surface antigens on this uh, v on the VLP platform is in a very high density repetitive manner. The high density repetitive uh, manner of uh, uh, antigen display is very very important because uh, that can also lead uh, that leads to very high um, a very potent immune response. So uh, there have been reports earlier. Uh, very old uh, literature uh, where people have shown that uh, you know your own, you do not produce antibodies uh, towards your own protein right but if you take your self proteins and you decorate these self proteins on a matrix in a high density repetitive manner and now immunize or you know inject it in animals the animal will produce antibodies so this is very important so high density repetitive display of antigens is extremely important uh, in uh, determining a good immune response and um, needless to say this is non replicating in nature so again it is uh, beneficial for uh, this platform now a very good example of vlp based vaccine is human papilloma based uh, papilloma virus vaccine and i have been very fortunate to work with this group um, this is john schiller's group i was directly under dr Christo christopher buck uh, and i was working uh, in the field of uh, jc polyoma virus where i worked on um, in a vlp based uh, vaccine and we also got uh, a patent recently 2018 with uh, you know NIH and us, and uh, uh, so that group, uh, John Schiller's group, uh, is uh, one of the pioneers in uh, you know developing the HPV vaccine, Gardasil and Sovarix, uh, the L1 based vaccine. So what they did. 
so in HPV, you have a uh, virus particle. Uh, this is non-enveloped virus, and you have the capsid. L1 is the major capsid protein of this virus. So what uh, they did is uh, to put uh, the L1 gene in a plasmid-based vector, and now when you um, you know transfect. Uh, mammalian cell with this because you know this is a mammalian plasmid expressing the l1 uh, gene the l1 gene will uh, get expressed in the mammalian cell and will produce the uh, l1 uh, proteins the l1 proteins as i said you remember uh, just the previous slide that viral proteins self assemble so l1 protein also self assembles and it forms beautiful um, structures the capsids exactly like uh, the native virus so these uh, virions or the vlps can be purified and now they uh, the uh, companies can make gmp or glp grade uh, vlps and those can be injected in human as uh, the vaccine okay and it produces extremely good uh, antibody uh, uh, titer of antibodies now there are different ways uh, again this is for students so when we say vaccine administration there can be different types uh, how uh, a particular vaccine can be administered that again depends on vaccine to vaccine what is the type of vaccine and what is the platform that uh, people have used to de develop that vaccine so one is oral you know oral polio vaccine is one of the best examples then another one is the rotavirus vaccine is uh, oral uh, vaccine uh, where it's a non uh, non invasive platform then you have uh, some of the in, uh, the most common ones the injection based but there also you have different types you have intradermal so you know the skin have uh, the skin have uh, different layers you have the epidermis you have the dermis and you have the subcutaneous tissue you have the muscle and also you have the adipose tissue here so uh, intradermal means you uh, are injecting the vaccine just beneath the skin layer okay so in the uh, dermis so uh, a very uh, typical feature of intradermal injection action is that uh, when you do that it forms a bleb oh, no, you know you can you can see that the small bleb filled with liquid okay and then you have subcutaneous it uh, depends on the angles of the needle uh, and you have the intramuscular it's you just jab directly 90 degree into the uh, muscle so intramuscular okay now uh, when i say uh, you know commercial vaccine come there is a difference between commercial vaccine and what we make at lab, laboratory levels. So uh, that difference comes uh, from the stabilizers and the antibiotics and the preservatives used uh, uh, by the commercial source, which is not used uh, at the laboratory levels. What is common are the antigens and the adjuvants used. Stabilizers are basically to maintain the effectiveness during the storage because you know it will it will be stored. You you are not making it again and again uh, every day, so you have to store it. That's why stabilizers so that it doesn't get destroyed. And then you have antibiotics because a lot of these vaccines um, are made from cellular uh, sources like yeast platform or even bacterial source or say mammalian cells. So they might get bacterial contamination. So there is a very minimal uh, percentage of antibiotics that is used to prevent bacterial contamination when uh, immunization is done or uh, injection is done in the human system. And then you have preservatives. Again, uh, this is for bacterial and uh, to prevent the bacterial and fungal growth. Okay. So now, you know, we, we are talking about COVID-19 vaccine, how fast it is possible to get the vaccine. It is a very hot topic now. Uh, every day we are discussing it. There are news after news in newspapers. So uh, let's, uh, so that is why I have put two slides here to walk you through what it takes for from laboratory uh, to clinic uh, for a vaccine uh, to emerge. You know, so is it really fast? No, it is not. It is a very slow process. You have to uh, be patient. So the first step is um, the uh, type of vaccine. So first you have to know what is the, uh, you know, platform you will be using. So it will be a, a VLP based. It will be a subunit vaccine. It will be your attenuated vaccine. It will be an inactivated vaccine. So what is it? And then what is your antigen? 
So once you have decided that, then you make these uh, vaccine candidates uh, candidates at laboratory level, and then uh, validate. Uh, first, you have to see, of course, it's stable or not, uh, the integrity of these molecules, and then you have to check the uh, neutralizing antibody titers uh, in small animals at laboratory level, like mice. Okay, so once you have done that and you know that your vaccine candidate is really, really working uh, and it's you are getting good neutralizing antibody titles, not only antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, so neutralization assays need to be done. So when I say neutralization assays need to be done, uh, needless to say that you also have to establish either share or, uh, you know, get it or establish a neutralization assay system, right? So, um, so after all these, you get approval for testing such candidates in humans, and it's only after that the clinical trial starts. Clinical trials, when I say that, it's again a different story. So let's see what it is. A clinical trial involves different phases, phase one and two. Sometimes phase one and phase two are uh, spoken differently in different contexts, but sometimes you might see people writing phase one slash two. So phase one and two, and then you have phase three, and there is another phase four as well, but before that you get approval uh, of using the vaccine, um, uh, you know, releasing the vaccine in the market. So phase one and phase two essentially talks about the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine. Okay. So once the safety and efficacy is uh, determined, then you go to larger uh, population and you do a mass level testing. So the number of individuals basically vary from tens to hundreds and then thousands. So not only the numbers, you also focus on different geographical locations. So your vaccine candidate should work uh, uh, with respect to um, uh, all the different geographical locations, not only the country or the continent where it has been uh, you know, discovered or, you know, put forward to, so it should work other places also. So it's only after all these extensive elaborate studies that a vaccine is released in the market. Okay. So now, uh, specifically coming to COVID-19 vaccine, so when I say that, um, most of the vaccine candidates that have been talked about and that have come into picture um, uh, today uh, in uh, with respect to COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 uh, are focusing on the spike protein. So the spike protein, um, as we know already, that uh, it is the crown-like structure on the virus uh, surface. It binds to the ACE2 receptor. And then there is a cleavage site um, between, uh, so there are two uh, you know, subunits of uh, spike protein, the S1 and the S2. There is another uh, protease or uh, protein on the cell surface called as TMPRSS2. It will cleave uh, the spike between S1 and S2, and then this helps in this uh, in the entry process, the fusion process. Okay. So most of the uh, people who are uh, targeting S protein are either taking the entire S protein as a pre-fusion complex or they are focusing on the receptor binding domain or say uh, there's one subunit. Okay, so the vaccine efforts, uh, if I talk about the overall uh, what's happening on, on the entire world there, are, as I already told you in the first slide, there are 139 just beautiful, beautiful effort that everyone has uh, put forward in such a short period of time. 139 candidates are in preclinical trial and almost 30, it's uh, yesterday's, um, uh, I checked it yesterday, so 30 um, are in clinical evaluation right now. Now, within India, what's happening, there are almost uh, seven different companies. I have listed six here. There is one more that was there in use, but I haven't put it here because I couldn't get much data on it. But uh, yeah, so there are seven different companies. Uh, two of them got approval for conducting phase one and phase two, uh, phase two clinical trials. Uh, so those are uh, those are coming from Bharat Biotech uh, and is based on whole virus inactivated uh, vaccine type. Cadilla Healthcare um, is focusing on uh, DNA plasmid vaccine. 
So they are under phase one, two uh, clinical trials. Uh, there is a recent news that came a um, few days back that um, Bharat Biotech has most probably, uh, even Cadilla Healthcare has got results of uh, phase one trial, but it's, uh, it's not published as a peer reviewed publication. But, uh, okay, so, and there are three more companies that uh, that have been listed to be uh, carrying out preclinical uh, studies or uh, on different types of uh, vaccine candidates. So, some of the um, major vaccine candidates that have undergone, that are undergoing phase two and three trials, I have uh, put it here, and they have been, uh, this is, there are peer-reviewed publications um, there, one, uh, is the Chadox one uh, and COVID-19 vaccine. The Oxford vaccine, um, uh, we also call it as, uh, the paper was published in Lancet, which involved 1,000, 1,077 participants. And then there was uh, this, there is this Russian uh, vaccine candidate, uh, uh, the, although the um, it, uh, trial has been carried out in uh, not too many people, 76 people. Uh, and then you have uh, two mRNA-based vaccines coming from, um, you know, NIH, um, Moderna, and uh, Pfizer. So they are in uh, also late-stage uh, clinical trials. Then you have the two Indian vaccines. As of 28th August, I can point out three uh, three major vaccine candidates from Oxford, from uh, Moderna, and from uh, Pfizer that have uh, that have published um, reports, interim reports, and uh, these are uh, in good shape right now and promising. I will review very briefly about uh, two of these. Uh, which we have been discussing recently in newspapers also. So the COVID-19 Oxford vaccine, we also call it as Chadox-1, or why Chadox-1 is chimpanzee adenovirus Oxford, so Ox uh, and, and COVID-19. So this is a chimpanzee adenovirus-based vaccine. So chimpanzee adenovirus was modified genetically extensively uh, many years back by this group, and uh, that's how a Chadox-1 virus, uh, adenovirus vector was uh, developed. And in this vector, now they have introduced the spike protein uh, gene, the DNA, and now when uh, this uh, vaccine candidate is uh, injected, uh, it infects uh, the adenovirus uh, vector, it infects different cells, it has a broad tropism, it infects different kinds of uh, cells and it expresses the viral proteins. And uh, so the virus pro viral proteins will now elicit the immune response. Uh, although neutralizing antibodies have been uh, studied and also T cell uh, response have been seen, uh, the direct challenge of um, uh, the human with uh, the virus and to see whether in, uh, vaccinated individuals are protected against uh, infection has not been checked for obvious reasons. So this part is pending. Um, so broadly how they have done, they had uh, four major groups, either uh, one of the groups. Uh, so this is a blinded multicentric so different centers were involved and randomized controlled trial. Uh, age group was 18 to 55 years. Uh, they haven't included old age and children. They will be doing eventually. Um, so uh, they had either the vaccine group, the Chadox uh, vaccine, or they have used meningococcal vaccine as the control. Um, in one of the groups they, uh, where they um, administered a booster dose was after 28 days of priming. And then in the final group, uh, they tried uh, one gram of uh, prophylactic uh, paracetamol uh, after every six hours. And after this administration, they uh, immunized, immunized uh, the individuals. So this was to make sure um, that uh, the fever and the muscle pain that are common um, in, due to vaccination doesn't happen. Okay, so um, as I said, uh, the most common side effects were fatigue and fever, malaise and uh, muscle aches, which disappeared or uh, reduced uh, to significant extent uh, upon the booster dose and was uh, not so much prominent in case of paracetamol administration. And uh, they produced, they could see very good uh, neutralizing antibody titer. And here I have uh, just shown the ELISA um, assay that uh, they did. 
and interferon gamma L-spot assay to check whether T cells are elicited or not. So yes, we could see. These groups are still, uh, will be followed up for uh, um, almost one year, and they are also running into uh, phase three trials, and uh, those are underway in Brazil, South Africa, UK, and eventually it will be evaluated. So just excuse me for a moment. My battery is uh, going low, so I'll just uh, put my charger in. Okay. Okay, so I'll continue like this. Uh, so here, uh, let's talk about the mRNA-173 vaccine. So this is another one that is that have recently um, published uh, its phase one two trial uh, results, and this comes from Moderna. So again, uh, the like Chadox one, the age groups were similar, um, but this is a mRNA based vaccine, and it was based on pre-fusion spike trimer, and uh, this mRNA was encased inside a lipid nanoparticle or LNP shell. Uh, the difference here is uh, the dose escalation. This was a dose escalation type of trial, an open label trial. This was not blinded. And there are two, three different doses that were tried 25 microgram, 100 microgram, and 250 microgram. Out of this, 100 microgram was found to be the best. That also elicited some T cell response, and um, the uh, you know the side effects were common ones, fatigue, chills, headache, but those were not of major concern. Okay, and um, a similar study was done by Pfizer, but uh, here uh, they although theirs is also an RNA-based uh, vaccine, but they focused on um, only the RBD domain. And here also, uh, they got a very promising, especially T, uh, uh, T uh, you know, uh, the follicular, they saw that the follicular, um, uh, you know, long-lasting plasma cells, B cells, got uh, stimulated, so which is uh, very important. So with that, I will uh, finish. Uh, and IICD. And... Uh, a member of India's India provided a very, very strong platform uh, for the young scientists of the country. And then I have been funded uh, by SCRB, DST, TBT, and um, Government of West Bengal, DST, and a member of Royal Society of India. So I uh, for considering me uh, for their memberships. And thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ray, for a uh, very, very informative and uh, long-awaited uh, solution for uh, this infection. So over to uh, Dr. Haldar, question answer session. If you have some questions. Okay, very good question, and it is uh, one question that is really been asked again and again, and it is very important to know it does take time. It takes years, basically, to be uh, very frank, and if you uh, really um, are into getting something very fast, as you have seen, we can just uh, go into evidence-based experiences. So um, most of the companies started uh, developing uh, the vaccine that are into now phase three or phase two uh, completed stage. They started uh, when the pandemic started. So you can uh, now guess now the phase three will start or have uh, started. So as I've already told you in phase three, uh, you might get thousands and thousands of people at least for, uh, for a year. So we... Um, we should not uh, you know, um, expect something before 2021. Uh,
Have anything else? Okay. So, Vishwajit uh, Gayan asks. Okay, thank you. So, thank you for thanking me. What is your opinion concern of uh, global weather change and attack of viruses? Um, in last 10 years, wow, La in last 10 years, like swine flu, Zika, Ebola, mm, COVID and COVID-2. Okay, I, if I understand this question, uh, then uh, you want to ask uh, that what is the effect of global weather change on viral attacks? Well, um, as of I know, I don't have, I cannot relate scientifically um, with evidence that uh, uh, global weather change should have directly any influence on virus so the virus that is droplet phase gets dried off, but in all these are predictions, so you can't be able to that. So, is that the last question? Yeah, so uh, Parimal Raut. Parimal Raut asks that which type of COVID-19 vaccine is most likely to work? Um, which type of COVID-19 vaccine is most likely to work? Will a coronavirus vaccine need to be given annually? How long will vaccine immunity last? I will first answer the last part. How long will vaccine immunity last? That for that, uh, and is most likely to work. So uh, see, I think I really believe on um, answering scientifically and I don't believe on predictions much in science and uh, of course scientific predictions are welcome but not like that. Uh, so there are many uh, many vaccines that are under development and I, I believe that they all are promising that's why they are under development and have been uh, permitted by uh, the regulatory bodies for conducting the, uh, uh, the clinical trials. So most of them uh, is what, what I looked into I could see um, worldwide uh, talking about the entire world. So they are either VLP based or they are, um, uh, you know, only two are mRNA. mRNA vaccine, uh, I would say um, one problem is the cold chain. So cold chain is a problem. So the stability is a problem uh, and uh, that involves cost. So I would say uh, the other types of vaccines um, are more uh, promising. Likely to work is something that, again, will depend on uh, the trial results. 
And will the coronavirus vaccine need to be given annually? That also depends on the uh, dose response. So you study the priming and the boosters, and then again booster, bo uh, do, do different ty different um, uh, types of booster doses, and you check out uh, how many doses you need. Okay, so you can you will have all those answers once you get all those publications in place, the interim reports in place, essentially. So that answers. Ramakrishna Das, will a coronavirus vaccine uh, need to be given annually? So I think I covered that. Uh, we have to uh, wait and watch that. Okay, Suman Das. Okay, so uh, again, so nice to see you again. That uh, shows that you are attentive. And <laughs> so though the uh, corporates are uh, looking for vaccines, but why uh, why there is very less significant research from institutes regarding actual actual medicine? Mm. So, mm, OK, so I will break this into two because I didn't understand the question. So if you are uh, if you are asking that if research institutes are also involved, then I will say, uh, yes, they are involved. So even for the Moderna's mRNA vaccine, it didn't uh, start from Moderna. It started from NIAID, NIH. Okay, so that's the institute. And uh, again, Oxford, it's a university. So, and then it was given to AstraZeneca to develop it further. And if I understand uh, that you want to ask that uh, even in India, you know, even in India, there are um, um, institutes, uh, different um, organizations working. And uh, like NIV came up with the live, uh, the inactivated uh, vaccine, uh, which was taken up by Bharat Biotech, which is undergoing trial now. So uh, that is what it is. And if you are asking that, uh, actual medicine by actual medicine you mean drugs then uh, um, so that is an entirely different aspect so both drugs as well as uh, vaccines are under consideration and are under study extensively as i said drugs um, uh, specific drugs drug discovery drug repurposing vaccine new vaccine new and uh, vaccine repurposing all are getting tested so all those areas are under uh, uh, consideration very much. But that takes time. Everything takes time. OK, Shiny Parel. Um, there were cases in which RT-PCR is positive, but IgG levels suboptimal. RT-PCR was positive, but IgG levels suboptimal. With a questionable IgG uh, uh, response, how far a vaccine uh, can develop? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but uh, RT-PCR positive, but IgG uh, is suboptimal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, RT-PCR uh, is positive and I, so that depends on, so you know, first is the IgM, then it comes the IgG, is, it also depends when the testing is done. Unless even if um, um, a strong IgG response is not seen. So see, these are naturally induced antibodies. When we talk about vaccination, we are making sure we are use, we are setting a dose that will induce strong immune response and we check it out. So when, in what dose and how many boosters are required for IgGs, uh, and not only IgG, we also, we are not only uh, focusing on IgG, that's where T cells are important. We are also focusing on T cells. So both the T cells and the B cell responses should uh, be elicited, right? Okay. Rajesh Vakshore. Uh, um, okay, how Russia developed its vaccine very fastly? Does uh, three phase? Uh, okay, yeah. So uh, Russia has not developed the vaccine fastly. Russia has not told also that uh, we have developed. Okay, so what comes in news or uh, that is a mixture of a lot of things. So Russia, um, what Russia have um, actually put in their report is not uh, the uh, till phase three. It's only 
they have said that they have seen uh, that in phase one trial they see that it's safe so the safety is, has been assured and so phase one phase two are uh, uh, sort of they are confident on it so phase they, they have finished till phase two and not phase three phase three is impossible they just started it how can they finish phase three? they have not finished phase three they have not even started phase three Okay, so Krishna Chaudhary uh, asks, what is your opinion of expected arrival of vaccine in India? By okay. Um, yeah, so, you know, um, I don't want to go into uh, this aspect again that um, there were promises made and uh, that's not possible. You know, you, as I said, I do not expect a vaccine uh, so both the vaccines, there are only two uh, vaccine candidates that have uh, been uh, given approval for phase one and two uh, trials only a month back, right? So in July, some sometime in July. So in one month period uh, or little more than that, they can only finish phase one or maximally phase two. They cannot finish phase three trial. Yeah, if they want to start uh, phase three uh, simultaneously with vaccination uh, of masses, informed vaccination, that is a different strategy. But I don't think WHO approves that. And they are also not saying that they are going to do that. So, um, so you can add up at least six to seven months uh, minimum before anything uh, can be really said that is happening. Okay, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ray. Uh, much. Yeah. Now, can I request uh, Professor Ghosh to give a vote of thanks? Was there a question? Any more questions? No, 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 at all. Okay, okay. Can I ask a question to Dr. Who wants to ask a question? Dr. Haldar, is there any question for Dr. Ray? No, 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 no. No? Okay. Or nothing. Okay, so over to Anuradha to conclude. I first thank the speakers who have given us their valuable time and spoken to us at length and shared their erudition and enriched us so much. We, are, we were really looking forward to their speeches and we have been really enlightened by them. I thank my uh, faculty members, uh, all the guests who have joined, and my very dear students who have joined this webinar and have been enriched by our speakers. Well, on behalf of Kanchandra College, a big thank you to all of you. Thank you. Mike, we can't hear you. Shatiri, you're muted.